this is uh, games that you should know by heart. I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borsch, and this time I'm going to show you one of my favorite players, Richard Rapport. But he's not my only favorite. I like Jababa too. So, but the occasion that I'm showing their games is very important because there was an Armageddon. If somebody can tell me what Armageddon game was played recently that was so important for the World Cup. Yes. Yes. So um, there was an Armageddon game between Levon Aronian and MBL, and that would decide who will be the qualifier for the candidates, as you mentioned. And now, the reason I'm showing few of these, few of the games of Rapport and Jabava is because the line that will be featured in that Armageddon game is none other than the Jabava Rapport variation. And that's why I'm showing you these first games so you get used to those positions. Okay, so Rapport plays what move? What his favorite number one move usually? D4. D4, yes. It's, it was an advantage to know the ecosystem because <laughs> from D00 you can <laughs> tell it's not going to be B3 today, which he plays just like uh, Jobava does. So he plays D4, Knight F6, and now he will decide where he will put the bishop. What's the guess? Where will he put this, his bishop right now? Some people say bishop f4. Anyone else? Once, twice. Bishop g5. This time it's bishop g5. So this is the Trompovsky. d5, e3, c5, c3. Now, if you have an eagle eye, you can tell that this is basically a position, a Slav position reversed. Where the bishop is outside the pawn chain, and we have this regular pawn structure. Veyi is known to many as one of the best prodigies, but in this match, Rapport actually beats him. Knight c6, knight d2. And let's try to make a natural move with black here. And that's what Veyi plays. e5 yes now this move is not good for a simple reason that black is not developed yet so this was a good game so we can learn that we shouldn't open the position when we are black because we are down a lot of tempi and the easiest way to get an advantage when you have a tempi advantage is to open up the position. <coughs> How did Rapport open up the position? D takes e5, knight takes e5. F4 would be a bit too aggressive. Also, it would weaken the e-pawn, which we wouldn't want to do. Knight F3, yes. Natural moves are sometimes the best. Knight takes F3. Knight takes F3. Bishop E7. And chess is a tragedy of one tempi. And Rapport asks one question before where you would castle. And what's that question? <laughs> what is the move that asks that one question that you're a little bit late? Bishop b5 check. Before you go, I'm wondering where your king is headed. King f8 would be admitting that 
the plan didn't work. So bishop d7. And how can rapport voice force the issue? Bishop takes. Queen takes d7. In ninety five. So Rapport just asked, before you go, how about I stop you from castling? So the queen could maybe try to go to b5, but that would lose a pawn. Let's say he played queen f5. But if he plays queen b5, white could consider either like queen b3, still annoying, or just taking on f6 and queen takes d5. He played queen f5. And now Rapport asked again, check. Where are you going? And apparently nowhere, because knight d7 would run into bishop takes c7. And if the queen takes on e5, bishop takes c5. White is a pawn up. He's going to castle, and black is totally lost. If the king takes, then the king is just stuck in the center. So he plays king f8. Now white finds another very good move here. Bishop takes f6. Because if bishop takes, then what happens? And after king g8? Yeah, knight d7 just wins the pawn. King g8 and knight takes c5. And there's no way they can bother our king because it's very safe because of this uh, e3, f2 structure. So out of necessity, black played g takes f6 because queen takes f6 is ill-advised due to knight d7 check. g takes f6. And now a very good grandmaster move comes. Knight f3. Job is done. Black didn't castle. He has a terrible structure. And in long term, black is just totally lost. Because eventually, the d5 pawn might get weak and also the f5 square, which we will soon see. Rook g8, knight h4, defending the g2 pawn, also emphasizing that that f5 square is going to be his. Queen e6, queen c2. Now, long moves are always tricky. OK, that's not a legal castle. Let's say king moves to g1 is. And there is a nasty little trick here that where you just set up, yes, rook g4. And there's no way to stop the loss of a knight. But Rapport saw that and just played queen c2. Emphasizing, I'm going to jump on f5, and no one is going to stop me doing that. d4. In a way, he is usually a tactician, and he knows that this is the last moment he can stir up some trouble. Otherwise, he'll just be positionally lost. So, why plays g3? If d takes e3, White might even consider castling, say takes, queen takes f2. And for the pawn, white will be able to bring the rook to e1. And after knight f5, it's just disaster for black. Queen d5. Do we want this queen to stay active on d5 or not? Not really. So we'll just chase it away. e4, queen c4. And here, Rapport plays a very good move. Liquidating move, but a good one. Did anyone say something? Queen e2, then he might have d3 or queen takes c2, d takes c3. And yeah. Queen b3, OK. He found this brilliant idea of b3. Now this seems to be losing a pawn. But 
Rapport realized he'll get it back with benefit. Takes Longcastle. And the king will just munch on the C pawn later. F5, trying to get active. C, you can see that Veyi is trying really hard to stir up something, but by now it's too late because the knight is a monster on F5 right now. Rook G6, how should we continue? With white. Rook d7, yes. Rook e6, takes, takes. King c2. And now white will just gobble up this pawn and will have one extra pawn. Also a better structure. Rook d8, king takes c3, b5, king c2. Rook d6, rook d1. Notice that Rockport would be happy to exchange pieces as he's a pawn up any endgame is winning for him. Mostly pawn endgames. Rook h6, h4, rook f6, queen d2, or rook d2. Rook a6, king d3, rook c2, g4. He's slowly mobilizing those pawns. c4, takes, takes, king d4. He doesn't want any kind of funny business. Because if, let's say, king takes c4, black might consider getting active with king e5, king f4, and Nobody knows, nobody knows. But he didn't want any of that and played king d4, rook a4, takes now, e5, f3. He's slowly moving up his pawns, and because they will be connected, this position is dead lost for Veyi. Rook a6, rook b4, king c7, g5, rook e6, rook a4, f4. And now, Rapport made a brilliant break. How did he do it in this position? G6 would lose a pawn. There's too many pawns. H5? That's not really a pawn break. It's may maybe helping the idea of a pawn break? E6. E6. And, then F6. and the idea of takes, then F6, and the pawns are unstoppable. Eventually, they'll just turn into two passed pawns, and that's over. So Veyi resigned. OK. So the other game is, I'm going to show from Rapport, is against Tari Aryan. D4, knight f6, bishop g5. He likes playing this line. D5, e3, knight d7. Knight d7 I'm not a big fan of because it's very passive on d7. So Norwegian player didn't quite grasp the situation. The knight would be, for example, e6 is better. Let's say knight d2, c5, c3, knight c6. And the knight is just happier on c6 than on d7. Knight d7, knight f3, c5, c3, e6, knight d2, bishop e7, bishop d3, castles, a4. Well, the idea of a4 is, for example, if white will play h3, a really unnecessary move, then black could go c4 and maybe eventually b5 after rook b8, let's say b3, b5. And this is approximately even. But Rapport doesn't want any of that and plays a4. b6. And do we know Rapport as a peaceful, drawish player? No. He goes for the full point, which is the most aggressive move we can find. It looks, actually, it visually looks passive, but it's an aggressive move that Rapport found in this position. Hint, it's a queen move. Queen c2, that's too active. It's okay. Active moves are good in general. Hmm? Queen b1. Queen b1 is actually a very clever move because it's multifunctional. It hits on h7, but it has other ideas. What's White's other idea? Did anyone? B4, yes, exactly. 
So if bishop b7, white can just play b4 and gain some space. He didn't want to play a long positional game though, so he, gone, he had gone h4. h6, bishop f4, knight g4. And now if we know that Rockport is going for mate, we might find his next move enterprising and fun and also good. What did Rapport play here? No, no, no bishop h7 check. Knight g5. He's going for the win. But okay, Tari didn't want to get mated yet. <laughs> h takes g5 obviously would be suicidal because there would be a check. King h8, h takes g5. And this is very threatening. And after, let's say, queen c8, there's a very nice finish in this position. How can white? Like, yeah, bishop g8. And even though black can try to stop the mate with knight h6, queen h7 would still mate black. It's quite a nice mate. But OK, Tari didn't want to get mated. Weird. Knight f6. And here, Rapport again comes up with an original idea. Actually, I think he was kind of visualizing what actually happened later on. Bishop g6, that's too creative. It's interesting, but it's most likely a bit too much. Well, on which file we're trying to play with white? On the h file. So in the near future, king e2, that's close, but not the f3, no? But king e2 is close, it's close enough. You didn't want to decide yet if he wants to move the king or not. Oh, then, then rook h3. Yeah, rook h3. Pretty creative move. Mm -hmm. Really in the style of Bronstein. Setting up a trap and asking his opponent, hmm, are you going to fall for it or not? Well, we shall see. Queen c8, knight df3. And now knight e5 is kind of coming, and that's annoying. So Tari took the bullet and took on g5. How should we take it back? Pawn takes, obviously. Knight e4. And he found this knight irritating, so he took d takes. And now Rapport found an original solution here. King d2, yes. And the queen swings from b1 to h1 with deadly threats. Now, black could try to play f6, which he didn't do. g6, and after queen e8, what would be the nice finishing touch? Rook h8 takes check and we thank our opponent for the cooperation. He played g6 instead, so he continued with our plan, queen h1, f6, and now he played again another very good subtle move. And I think that's the one that Tari might have missed. It's white to move and win. Rook h7 with the idea. Rook h7, mm -hmm. seven. Rook h7 deadly. And black is helpless against the slow burning threat of queen h6, queen j7 mate. Because most likely what Tori might have looked at was check, king goes to f7, and the king might run away from e8 through d8. 
But after rook h7, you can take this, but that doesn't help you. Queen h6, and mate. There's no way to stop. The only idea to stop the mate from g7 is rook f7, but then just rook h8, mate. So we can see these unusual ideas that keep popping up. And Rappert is famous for that. But there's another guy who's famous for original ideas, and that's Jabava. d4, d5 is the other way to reach this position. We often do, because the Slav is very popular these days. But then they play knight c3, knight f6, bishop f4. But anyways, it will transpose knight f6, knight c3, d5, bishop f4. And whenever I see knight c3 and bishop f4, I always think about the Jabava Rapport um, duo, because they've done so much for this opening. Rapport beat Sutovsky in the Olympiad um, with this very variation. And Jabava won many games, which I'm going to show right now against Ponomaryov. c5, e3, c takes, e takes. Now this is actually, if you think about it, is a reversed <coughs> Chigorin. Excuse me. a6. And even in the Chigorin, when black plays that line, He's going for speedy development. How can white go for a speedy development in this position? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, bishop d3 is very nice, and that's what Jababa did. How Rapport played it was knight f3, and that was his game against Sutovsky. So Jababa tried bishop d3 because they always like to experiment in their path line. Knight c6, knight g2, e6. I'm not thrilled with this e6 move because that bishop will be a prisoner on c8 forever. Queen d2, b5. Black is trying to play b4, but white stops that after castles and plays a3. Bishop d7. And we can see that this bishop is pretty unhappy. You move it one square, that's not really great. Bishop would be happy to be on g4. h3, castles, rook e1, knight a5, rook d1, queen b6. And even though this knight looks funny on c3, and it is funny, um, usually a pawn should be pushed. And this knight is happy on c3, but it stops from white developing a center, which would be useful. But in general, we can see that Everything that Jabava did was pretty harmonic, right? Knight g3, rook fc8, and now fireworks start. How did Jabava start fireworks in this position? Think about it before you check the move. Whenever you're looking for sacrifices, always look for undefended pieces. Yeah, knight f5. And for a gifted tactician like Jabava, it's nothing to find an unprotected piece. So, Ponomaryov, who was a FIDE World Cup champion, and a FIDE World Champion, decides to take the knight. He could have also tried to move the bishop. That would be a different idea. So he takes, rook takes e7, bishop e6. And now, Jabava makes the move of 2016. Pretty brilliant idea. And unusual. It's not hard to notice that the rook on e7 is kind of trapped. So if white doesn't do something quickly, he'll be punished. Yeah, bishop h6. 
an astounding move which should get like five exclamation points because it's not every time you just put your bishop on pre and it's perfect. It's perfect. You can use any engines, five of them. It's still going to say this is a brilliant move. And this is why I'm all awed by Jabava's creativity that he can find spectacular combinations like these. So king f8 wouldn't work because bishop takes g7. If king takes g7, then queen g5 check, and white just takes the knight. But if king takes e7, then white can take on f6. And I wonder what would happen if black would take on f6. What would happen if king takes f6? Always look for undefended pieces. Mm -hmm. Knight takes d5, and after bishop takes d5? Yes. And knight takes d5 would finish the game, because takes. So double attack, and the undefended queen on b6 is taken. So he took, queen takes h6, rook takes c3, queen g5 check. F8. Queen takes F6. You're not bothered by that rook. And surprisingly, even if black would play rook C7, I can just take on F5. You can take on E7 if you'd like, but then I'll checkmate you on H8. Oof. And that's a pretty nice mate. So out of desperation, Ponomaryov took on D3. C takes D3. But actually, Black cannot stop white from playing the simple plan of rook e1, rook takes e6. Let's say queen d6. We're not troubled. The rook is still taboo because queen h8 is mate. And otherwise, rook takes e6 just wins the game. And now, another <coughs> Jabava rapport variation, d4, knight f6, bishop f4, a6. Black is stopping knight b5 ideas, a move that is often played by Jabava and Rapport. For example, if black plays e6, both Rapport and Jabava plays knight b5, knight a6, and a3, trying to stop Black from playing bishop b4 after c6, knight c3, there is no bishop b4, which would be annoying. And the point of this knight b5 idea that this knight on a6 is pretty clumsy, and it doesn't really function well there. So that's why Savchenko played a6. And, you, and as my, you have noticed, this was played in the Bronstein Memorial. Bronstein, who was kind of the forefather for bo both Rapport and Jabava. And look what Jabava does in this game. e3, g6, and now he plays a move that Bronstein would definitely be proud of. How did Jabava continue in this position? h4, yes. Bishop g7, and without hesitation, all three of them would play h5. Knight h5, bam, rook takes h5, takes, queen takes h5. And this looks like a coffee house game, but Jabava knows what he's doing. Because these light pieces will be so strong in these positions that they can compensate for the material deficit that white has. So let's see how it continues. c6, knight f3 h6, castles, knight d7, queen h2. Now, Jabawa is cheeky, just like Bronstein. He's kind of hinting on bishop c7, which would be a cute little queen trap. Obviously, black is a grandmaster, he doesn't fall for that. Plays knight f8, which is a bit weird. Knight f6 would seem more natural. Knight f8, bishop c7, queen d7, bishop e2, knight e6, bishop e5. Well, it's a close-up position, so 
In close-up positions, what type of pieces do you need? Knights. Knights. How many knights does white have? Two. The maximum amount. amount. So that's great. No, I'm not <laughs> that's true. But you're not going to promote a pawn yet. Rook h1, f6, bishop g3, knight g5. A gracious offer by black. Did white accept? No. Knight e1. And where is that knight headed? C5. C5. Castle, knight d3, queen f5, bishop f4, knight c5. And you can see that in these closed up positions, knights just function much better than rooks. So I would, wouldn't say that black is better anymore because the knights just feel so dandy in this particular situation. Queen h7, g4, trying to stop black from playing bishop f5. Queen g6, bishop c7, b4, knight a4. And the other knight is going to b6. This is just paradise for these knights. e5, knight b6, rook a7, bishop b6, rook e8, f4. Complete domination. Those knights just dominate all those rooks, and that bishop on c8 is just terrible. Knight f7. And when you're trying to develop an initiative, the first thing you should think about, which one of your pieces is not playing at all? Which bishop? The bishop on e2. So let's help that bishop. How can we help that bishop? How can we help bishops in close positions? Open the position. G5. Sacrificing a piece, not a problem. Knight takes d6, bishop h5, queen f5, g takes h6. And this is something that grandmasters realize. They don't try to, they don't like exchanging good pieces for bad ones. Like this exchange would be just great for black because that rook wasn't doing anything at all anyways. So g takes h6. He'd rather remove this defender on g7, which is bad, but it's a defender. Rook e7, h takes g7, rook takes, f takes, f takes, knight takes c8, knight takes c8. And the next move is another Jabava brilliancy. It's Jabava to play and make a wonderful move. And what Jabava actually really brilliant at is imagining things. At the moment, the black king can hide away on f7 and potentially on g6. But what if the g6 square is blocked by a black piece? So bishop g6 indeed was played. If rook takes g6, I would just lose because of queen h8, king f7, rook h7 check, and will mate soon enough. Takes, takes, here, mate. But he took on with the queen, check on h8, and rook f1. And that's why imagination is so important in chess. The king can't move to g6 anymore because a badly placed black queen. And after queen f6, rook takes f6 would win. But he played queen, king e7, which runs into queen f8 mate. OK, so we saw two Jabava rapport brilliances in their variation. Now let's see the game of this year, 2017. D4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, bishop f4, bishop g7. So let me set the scene. Aronian was dominating this match against Vachier, but then it all petered out to be a draw. MVL had some chances in the tiebreak sessions, but then Aronian equalized. So this game went all down to the Armageddon game, where black has four minutes to white's five minutes. 
MVL decided to choose the black pieces. And Aronian goes for the Jabava, Jabava rapport variation, knight c3, d5. And as we pointed out earlier, white can force something here. What did white play in this position? No, not h4, not this time. Knight b5, yes. So black didn't play a6, actually didn't have time to play a6 because e4 was threatened. So he couldn't stop white from playing knight b5. And this is just like or very similar to um, rapport Veyi game and many games played by Jabava. e3, castle, h3. c6, knight c3. Actually, they played this very same position in a previous tiebreak game where Aronian was winning, but this time Vashi came well prepared and played knight c7, bishop e2, b6. We've seen previously in the rapport Veyi game what happens if black opens up the position early, right? It was a debacle for black. So MVL realizes that this Knight c3, bishop f4 is not just roses and ginger ale, and he decides to develop a slow burning initiative on the queen side. So he plays bishop b7, bishop h2, c5, a4, a5. Most probably, Aronia was planning to play a5 and put some pressure on the queen side. But a5 is a very good move, stopping all of these ideas. Now, may I remind you that if Aronian draws this game, this game, he loses the match. So he must win somehow. Knight e5, knight d7, takes, takes, bishop g4, e6. Okay, honestly here black's position is okay. And apart from this very ugly knight on c7, his position is decent. And also we can feel that this knight on c3 is pretty badly placed. Queen d2, bishop c6. How can white bolster this a4 pawn? With b3, rook c8, knight e2. And obviously Aronian is conscious of the fact that this knight is pretty clumsy there, so he moves it to a better place. c takes d4, and he takes with the knight. b5. And actually, if you're familiar with d4 type of positions, this is kind of a reversed kind of um, minority attacks. a takes b5, knight takes b5, c3, knight takes d4. And knight takes d4 is a nice move, but in general, MVL is aiming for exchanges as a draw is great for him. e takes d4, a4. But I think a4 was a little bit too much. It's not a bad move. But there was no need to rush with that. b4, bishop b5, rook c1. Because in the long run, this a pawn might get weak. Hint, hint. a3, bishop e2. And now, black plays queen c6, which he really shouldn't have. He should have taken on e2. And in general, I think black is pretty much OK, if not better. So he played queen c6, and now, Aronian takes his chances. Take your time and try to find the best move in this position. Obviously, this c3 pawn is a bit backwards and kind of weak. So if we can find a way to stabilize the situation for white, white might even get some chances in the near future to win this game. So the goal would be to find a move that can potentially shield this pawn on c3. Yes, bishop b5, queen b5, bishop d6. Now I was live tweeting when I was looking at this Armageddon game, and I always felt that this was the critical turning point. After this, 
White will get the bishop to c5. And to be honest, objectively, now on white just has the better chances. Because this a pawn will be chronically weak, and black will be without any real plans. Rook c6, bishop c5, rook a6, rook a2. Obviously, we're blocking that a pawn. We don't want that to move too much. Bishop, queen, queen c4, queen e2, and now bishop f8. Are we planning to take on f8? No, no not at all. King f1, e5. But now, as you sacrifice the pawn, then we take. And now, I'd say that white has the better chances. Maybe it's not winning yet, but Aronian has real chances of winning. But this is the moment the game really gets interesting, because they're slowly running out of time. King e7, king e2, bring your king, if it's an endgame, and that's what the two grandmasters do. d4 takes king d5, and Levon plays rook d2. But there's another move that he could have played, which would be equally or maybe even slightly stronger. What other move Aronian can play in this position? Rook c7. Rook c7 would go for pawns. But in rook end games, usually you should aim to have quality past pawns and not taking pawns. And in order to have a good passer, you have to give them good protection. No, rook b2. Rook b2, exactly. He played rook d2, which is fine. But rook b2 might be even stronger, as after king takes d4, b5, and this pawn starts running. And eventually, the a2 pawn falls and should be pretty good for white. Rook d2, king c4, d5. But he chooses to run with the d-pawn. King takes b4, d6, king b3. And now, Levon tries an idea that's rarely seen. The white king is kind of using a ladder and tries to walk the stairs through h4, g5, f6. King d4, king h4, king d5. And now, Levon plays king g5, which doesn't spoil anything, but he has a slightly better move here, which is also winning, but maybe would be more forceful. G4, that's kind of similar. Right? Yeah, G4 is a good move, but there's something more direct that uh, Levon could have done. D7, yes. Because if king e6, we can sack. Because you can't take all of those, because we queen. And if you move the rook, I think I'll defend that pawn. And even if you don't defend that pawn, the white king is so active, most likely that position is also winning. Even though in general, four against three is a draw, but I wouldn't be so sure if this is a draw this time. King g5, king e6. But remember, this position was played with only seconds on the clock, and both is under great pressure. But now on, MVL will start fighting like a lion. g4 takes takes, and he plays rook a5, which is a tremendous fighting move, setting up this f6 trick. So white defends the e5 pawn, rook e2, f6, king takes g6, rook g8, king h6, rook takes g4. And now, Levon finds the only way to break through. It's white to move and get winning chances. Did you play this? What? Did you play check? F5 check, yes. Creating a passed pawn, e6. And now, it seems that the pawns are unstoppable. And it's very difficult to find the move, but the computer says, there is one, only one move that could have drawn for Vachier in this position, which, which would have gave him the chance to play in the candidate. It's a very weird move. 
But if you notice that the White King is in trouble, and actually MBL noticed that, but he chose the wrong way to attack uh, black, the White King's position. Yeah, he played rook a8, okay. but the move is rook a a4. Oh. And the great trick here is that if white would push the pawn like a crazy person, then it'll be check, check, mate. So it's something that white would want to avoid. So he needs to check first. Rook f4, rook takes f4, takes f4. If you push the pawn, then black queens. So white has to take, king takes e6, and it's a draw. At best for white. So that's why there's a good reason to keep on fighting on, because sometimes you might get a miracle chance. Now, MVL played rook a8, which was a decent try, but not good enough, because Aronian found the only win in this position. Notice that our passed pawns on e6 and d6 are about to reach the level where they're worth a rook. So I played rook f1 check. Rook f4 only move. How did Lavon Aronian continue? You take first, and rook takes a2. Uh, so does, does the order matter? Or the order matters. Because that's what I'm trying to understand. Is but also remember that you're in time trouble, so the clearer it gets, the better. So he took immediately okay. and took on a2 now, because it's now very clear that MVR can't stop the pawns from promoting e7, rook d2. Queens. And after this, it's a technical win for Aronian. King e3, king g5, rook d5 check. But is it really Ooh, a technical win? Like, what would the yes. time be here? Because yeah, they have like seconds left in this position. And, and, right. and seriously, so just, just, I mean, this endgame is just so memorized that, that the. Yeah, this is, is just lost, objectively lost. Okay. It doesn't really matter if you know it or not. But it's still like a 20 minute checkmate, though, isn't it? Yeah, but it's still a win. Yeah. And king e2 is played. Notice that Aronian posted his queen on f5, so he covers the c2 square. So after checks, king d2, and no more checks on c2 because the well positioned well, uh, white queen. Rook b3, check, queen d4. Nice little subtle move again. Because if black would start checking, which is the annoying part, then the king can move to b3, and there's no rook b2 check again, just because of this queen d4 move. Rook h3, queen b6, queen f6, king a2, check, double check, rook b3, king c2, king a1. One last trick. I should be finish up the game. Queen takes wouldn't be that great, because <laughs> that's stalemate. Queen a6 check, that's what Aronian played. And MVL congratulated Levon Aronian of becoming a candidate. That's how Aronian won against MVL. Mm -hmm.